फ्रेंड्स द फोन ऑफ द ट्रूथ चचारी अरे सचारी विच इज द वेरी खो ऑफ बुरिज्म आ वन ऑल दिस एंड सच इज सफरिंग दुख थ्रू क्वेरी इज अ कॉज ऑफ ऑल सफरिंग दुख का समुदाय थ्री एब्सेंस ऑफ ऑल क्रेविंग इज द एंड ऑफ ऑल सफरिंग Dukkha niroda. Four, the noble eightfold way leads to the end of all suffering. Dukkha niroda kamni patibada. The noble eightfold way leading to nibbana is simply this: right view, samaditi; right motivation, samma sankapa; right speech, samma rajya. Right action, samma kamanda. Right livelihood, samma ajiva. Right effort, samma vajjama. Right awareness, samma sati. And right concentration, samma samadhi. But what is right livelihood? What is this critical right livelihood? The fivefold definition of right livelihood is. One. Earning a living not involving any trading with living beings. Two. Earning a living not involving any selling of meat, fish, or flesh. Three. Earning a living not involving any selling of any form of weapons. Four. Earning a living not involving any dealing with alcohol or illegal drugs. Five. earning a living not involving any selling of any form of poison that is right livelihood the characterization of right livelihood for lay people is as follows any livelihood that neither involves any killing injuring harming nor any forced imprisoning of any living being no stealing taking what is not given cheating any bribery or corruption or lying or false deceiving tricks or for use of false measures or weights neither any sensual nor any sexual abuse neither the use of selling of alcohol nor of intoxicating illegal drugs that causes carelessness neither by oneself nor by getting nor inciting others employees to do so such is right livelihood and right livelihood for buddhist monks and nuns the monastic sangha is neither living by receiving food by astrology suits say prediction of future events nor by palmistry geomancy dream reading charms or spells amulets or fake divination nor by any rituals running errands or messages political flatter arranging marriages funerals or divorces no by medical practices no by producing art poetry or in professional disputation or debate that is right livelihood for further study and buddhist right livelihood samma ajiva go to what buddhasit.net and search for what is right livelihood Thank you for your attention, consideration, and contribution. And have a nice day. Hello to you, friends. This is Dhamma on Air, number sixty-eight. There's three questions: one simile, and one lotus offering, and the lotus offering comes right. Here and is from Mr. Matt McIntyre, Little River, South Carolina, and it comes right here. Hello to you, friends. This is the fifth lotus offering of eight lotuses for Mr. Matt McIntyre of Little River, South Carolina, United States, for his family, his children, 
and grandchildren. And these magnificent lotuses, red and white, are incense sticks, and them should now go and offer to the Lord Buddha's tooth, which lies under this golden roof here. Inside the octagon there, built by the last king, there is uh, all the books, uh, the species of the Buddha, the Tibitaka, in several versions, also in palm leaves. But now we'll go in and wash our feet and offer these magnificent lotuses for Mr. Matt McIntyre, his children, family and grandchildren. Thank you. To make the offering complete, we will first wash our feet three times. Probably done is that. You see all the Buddhist flags. Okay. And this is the main temple where the tooth is deposited. And this is the first floor. And behind this curtain, up on the second floor where we now will go, there the Buddhist right canine tooth is stored. Pinci de Viva. Pinci Rejoice in our offering. Pinci de Viva. Pinci de Viva. Pinci de Viva. And this is a Buddhist begging bowl. And here we will also make a small offering. No one understands single like this. Yeah, all the magnificent roses here and here. This is the Prince Dat, who brought the tooth, and Princess Himava, who had it in her hair. And this is where it transported the tooth around on the elephant. For Mr. Matt McIntyre from South Carolina, Little River, for himself, his family, children, and grandchildren. All blue lotuses. Garnet with white flowers, called simple flowers.
Bhagavatta. Hare Hatta Sumasana Vitas. Worthy, another, and perfectly certain. Coconut oil. Super Hyundai Buddha. Super Hyundai. Der er med der er en Ficus religiosa. Det er det Og det er svært, 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 Sari <laughs> Jeta vanam sele chai tiyam kata ka chare dam ka Dete sol sata nani ahang vanda me sab veda Ahang vanda mi datu yo ahang vanda mi te namo Sab ve pap visundas anant gune darino namami lokana tas Sadharam datu chetiyam sad 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 Nidam <laughs> Nyaya Patipano Bhagavato Savata Sango Sami Chi Patipano Bhagavato Savata Sango Yadidan Chattari Hello to you friends. This is Dhamma on Air number sixty-eight. Recorded the seventh July two thousand. On 17, on a misty day, on the mountain cloud forest of Pamparella, Central Hill Country, Sri Lanka, planet Earth. Today is, as usual, three questions, one simile, and then the intro has been on right livelihood of the Noble Eightfold Path. But first, as usual, the normal. So, 
नाम तस्सु भगवत्तु अरहत्तु सम्मा संबुद्धस्स वर्दी अनाबु and perfectly self-enlightened. What's the best Buddha? The simile is interesting. It's from the Samyutta Nikaya, which you see here. Uh, the twelfth book, the Nidana Vakka, of the connected discourses of the Buddha. And this chapter is on causation, or causality, or cause and effect. And now we are diving deep into uh, some subtle aspects of Buddhist philosophy. Like the three times, last time it, it, it circulates around the, the concept of the four nutriments or fuels that the process of rebecoming of samsara burns on. And the four fuels, the four nutriments, ahara, is as we remember, food, contact, intention, and consciousness. So the simile today is called the painter and his painting. And it's about a painter. He has four colors and he has uh, three boards. He has a wall he can paint on and he has a piece of wood he can paint on and a, a piece of cloth he can paint on. Then he has these four colors. The four colors symbolizes these four nutriments of food, intention, contact, and consciousness. When the painter, he paints these up on one of the boards, there will be a painting there. He paints male forms and female forms, and they are complete and captivating and interesting and very beautiful to look at for everyone who looks at them. The three boards symbolizes that you can be reborn either in Kamaloka from uh, level 1 to level 11, where all beings are obsessed by sense desire, Kamachanda. Then you can be reborn in Brahmaloka, the middle level, uh, from 12 uh, upwards. Uh, and then you can be born in Arupaloka, the top five levels, the formless levels of consciousness. These are the three boards you can paint on. So, this painter, what he symbolizes, he symbolizes this ego conceit, asmimana, the self-deception, that the mind, the consciousness and the thinking, they conjure up a self, an ego, and says, ah, this I am, this is me, this is what I am. This is a painter, and he paints up a painting, and he finds himself inside this painting of male or female forms, and he also finds a world in there. So the painter and the painting is kind of like a self-generating me and the world that generates itself. The painting can also be seen as Nama Rupa, Naming and forming, a tricky concept, but the most basic uh, and most general and generalizable concept of early Buddhism is an inseparable uh, dualism. It basically means name and form. But since there's no entities in Buddhism, it will better be translated to naming and forming as activities, impersonal, ongoing impermanent, transient activities, naming and forming. The mind names from something and thereby it forms it. When it observes the elementary particles, it comes into being and have properties and mass, location. It becomes definite. It manifests itself. Before the observer looks at it, then it's just a cloud of probability. So this naming and forming also goes right in quantum mechanics and not only in Buddhist philosophy. When there is naming and forming, then the I and the world appears. Why so? Because naming and forming starts 
name and form gets six senses, and then six senses starts having contact with the world. Thereby, it makes mental constructions. It forms intentions. It wants something in the world, and it wants to get away from something other aspects in the world. It wants food, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It wants to get away from aging, sickness, and death, critique, and blame. So this is mental constructions. This entails intentions for this and that, and against this and that. Intentions is the same as karma. Karma is the same as probability for future existence. Karma entails rebirth. Rebirth entails inherently aging, sickness, and death. Rebirth entails inherently suffering. This means basically what the painter, this ego concept, paints on his imaginary painting and conceives to be me and the world. This basically is suffering and nothing else than that. So as soon as the painter, he believes that there's happiness in this painting, or there's a self in these male and female forms on the painting, or there's a world in there in this colors on the canvas, then he creates suffering. If he believes it to be safety that there is in this painting, then he creates suffering. Now it starts to rain. Let's see how much. Another uh, simile goes like this, which is from the same uh, chapter. It's a a window, the Buddha say, if there's a window in a hut, where does a, and there's a western wall, where does the light fall? Ah, it falls on the western wall. And yes, but he say, but if there's no western wall, bhikkhus, monks, where does the light fall? Ah, it falls on the, on the earth then. Ah, but if there's no earth, where does the light then falls and, and forms a shadow? Ah, it falls on the groundwater beneath the earth. Ah, but there, if there's no groundwater, beneath the earth, where does it, the, the light then hitch or uh, cast a shadow? Uh, it doesn't cast a shadow, sir, because there's nothing it can cast a shadow on. And the same thing with consciousness. If there's no delight and craving in these four nutriments, food, contact, intention, and consciousness, if there's no delight and craving in that, then consciousness cannot come established. When consciousness cannot come established, it doesn't find a footing. Because there's nothing it can cast its shadow on. There's nothing it can be established upon. There's nothing it can set its foot down on and become established there. Then naming and forming cannot take place. There's no Consciousness and naming and forming doesn't occur. Then there's no mental constructions, no sankaras. No mental constructions means no intention. No intention means no karma. No karma means no future. No future means no future production. No future production entails no rebirth. No rebirth is the same as no aging, no sickness, no death. This, friends, and only this is the end of suffering. So, again, as soon as there is delight and craving for food, contact, intention and consciousness, then consciousness can't find a footing. Then naming and forming, name and form arise. Six senses arise. Contact arise. Intention arise. Karma arise. Probability for future rebecoming arise. Rebirth, aging, sickness, and death arise. And therefore, the suffering also arise right there at the moment of taking delight in and thereby create craving for and clinging to 
any form of food, any form of contact, whether visual contact, auditory contact, smell contact, gustatory contact, tactile contact, or mental contact, any form of contact, any form of intention, and any form of consciousness, visual consciousness, auditory consciousness, olfactory consciousness, gustatory consciousness, tactile consciousness, or mental consciousness. Any form of that, any form of taking delight in that, craving for that, urging for that, being satisfied by that, then right there suffering arises. Because consciousness can find a footing. So much goes for the painter and his painting. Notably, this painter, all painters that paint this future rebecoming, they think when they paint, the paint eye is very colorful. And so also being said, I and samsara, when they live their life and with great uh, enthusiasm and effort, they take up these boards and these paints and form all these activities of this and that without noticing that they right there create, condition, produce their own future suffering down the road. And it is this lack of awareness, satine, this lack of understanding, no panya, that this really is so, that keeps him in samsara, that keeps him in the round of rebirth and thereby redeath, and thereby endless suffering. This is just taking delight in painting the painting of becoming, of life of samsara. The painter and his painting and the window where the light comes in and hits something or doesn't hit something. When consciousness cannot find any footing, there, right there, emerges, arises, begins the end of suffering, the end, irreversible end of all suffering. So much for the painter and the painting, uh, Samyutta Nikaya, Book 12, Samyutta Nikaya, you see here, Connected Discourses of the Buddha on Causation, the Nidana Vakka. Then we go to the questions, the questions 202, 202. Good number. What is the Buddhist way of breaking up a relationship compassionately? Yes, of course, uh, first one should consider whether one should break up at all. And this is uh, uh, good to notice because uh, whether it's necessary uh, at all. And what's the criteria? If, if uh, other beings, whether it's in a, a love relationship or family relationship or teacher relationship or uh, colleagues at the job or uh, whatever relationship you have to other beings, if they cause you suffering and in a disrespectful way uh, keeps harming you and they keeps doing that for six times, then one is allowed by Buddha, he says, you can forgive them six times and use patience, forbearance, kanti parami, the mental perfection of patience, tolerance, forbearance, six times. But seventh time you are allowed to say cut. And then never look back. So, uh, in all, one should also know that in all relationships, family relationships, mother, father, uh, spouse, uh, lover, uh, brother, sister, uh, siblings, whatever relationship, colleagues, friends, whatever the relationship is, there will always be bumps on the road. And so, uh, no relationship can go on forever without in, in complete harmony. That's an illusion. That, that cannot be the case. It's impossible. So there is bumps on the roads. And there's bumps of all relationship roads. And usually it is so if one has patience enough and friendliness enough 
uh, to hang on in there. Then one will look back, both parties that has some kind of conflict at some particular bump in time, they'll look back and say, ah, okay, we came over these bumps. Now it doesn't matter. And then the, having coming over many of these bumps, their friendship and their relationship will become enriched by and enforced by being able to come over the bumps of emotional ups and downs and external events and internal events of whatever nature. So uh, the three code words should be patience, friendliness, and maintain harmony. That also goes in the case of once, uh, if one says, ah, now I'll have to cut contact to the particular being, whether in a love relationship or any kind of other relationship, also teacher pupil relationship, then one should say, ah, okay, uh, there can be no contact uh, with this being more because this contact entails suffering for me and for this being also and for other beings also. So this is not good. However, this doesn't entail that I have to be uh, fr uh, to see this person as an enemy or to take revenge because my emotion has been hurt or something like that. This as this person has hurt my emotion does not in any way give me right to hurt the other person's emotions or hurt the other person in any other revengeful way. So one just cut but do it in a very friendly but also very firm way. That's where the compassion comes in. I say, okay, I cannot have any contact with you, but you are not my enemy. Uh, I'll remain friendly towards you, and I will re I will keep on uh, creating a harmonious atmosphere here in between us, even though there has to be no contact. Huh? Uh, it's not easy, but it's possible. Uh, and when it it, it does it, it does succeed, then it's very pleasant. Because then one can approach people and leave them again without these uh, emotional storms stirring up one's life. If it's advantageous, kusala, to be together with these beings, have association with them, company with them, or be in contact with them in any way. Yes, advantageous for oneself or for others or for the world. Yes, then one, one can do. If it's detrimental, it's just hurtful, painful, problematic, uh, full of conflicts. And then uh, it might not be a good idea if these conflicts and emergencies of disharmonious, detrimental aspects keeps reoccurring more than six times. So again, uh, one can leave uh, other beings if it's detrimental to have contact with them. Uh, one should know that all relationships has bumps on the road, uh, including friendships. So patience, friendliness, and harmony. Maintain harmony. Whether staying there or leaving, maintain harmony by this friendliness. But also being very firm about it. I hope this answers those questions. Question number 203. Why did the Buddha not stay in the human world for his full lifetime? Why did he need Ananda to plead him to stay? Yeah, this is because uh, the Buddhas, and this goes for all enlightened beings, they have no need for or do not like to stay here in samsara. Because they know this is suffering. All this is suffering. All this is suffering also. So when they stay here uh, more than they have to, then it's because of compassion with other beings, that they want to give the raft of the Dhamma, the way to salvation, the way to lasting happiness, the way out of suffering. They want to give the method, the medicine, the noble eightfold way to other beings also. They don't need it themselves anymore because they have, they finished the job. They put down the burden. So uh, they don't like or dislike to stay in this world. So the middle way of that, uh, it is to say, okay, I stay if requested, but not if not requested. And this goes for all Buddhas. They stay here if requested, 
when they have finished the job of putting forth the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Way and has become established in the world. So that the whole India is one red flame of ropes. Goes to saying. So when this occurred, when their dispensation, their sasana, it's widespread over the entire India. And it cannot be eradicated again. This wheel of Dhamma that keeps rolling with the Four Noble Truths and Noble Eightfold Way. Then they are ready to go. And if aging, sickness and death then comes, then they welcome it. And so also God for other arahats, other awakened beings. They do not fear death, nor do they resist death at all. Why not? Because this is the ultimate party time for them. It is to enter Nibbana and Upadisesa. There's two Nibbanas. Nibbana Sa Upadisesa is Nibbana in Samsara. When you attain Nibbana before dying, then you are still in Samsara. Why so? Because there's remnants of Kama left. The Kama has not gone into zero left yet. So there's Kama still maintaining the body. There's no accumulation of new Kama. But there's still traces of old Kama that has not been exhausted left yet. When this happens, it goes to zero, the other dies. So uh, this is an actual process. For them, then when they die, then is Nibbana and Upatisesa. They go into a state which is Nibbana without trace of Kama lift. Without trace of clean lift. Without trace of becoming lift. Nibbana and Upatisesa. And this is a culmination of all life and all conscious being in samsara. It is the most, the moment they go into this state, Nibbana and Upatisesa, because this is irreversible ending of all suffering. All suffering. What so? So therefore, it makes sense uh, to say like this, if there's someone who requests me to stay here and teach, okay, I stay here and teach. If not, then I go and gain my prize, for which I have been struggled and striving for so many universal cycles, so many billions of lives for the sake of other beings. So now I'll take my prize of lasting happiness, of deathlessness, of absolute freedom, of complete peace. I waited long enough. So this, I think, is fair, uh, completely fair. If humanity not even can request uh, the teacher to stay, why should he stay? Why should he stay? And Ananda didn't ask him because Mara uh, keep telling him that he should be the leader of the Sangha. Afterwards, when the Buddha have gone, he, he, this didn't happen because Mahakasapa, Mahakashapa in Sanskrit, he was considered the father of the Sangha, righteously. And Ananda was a, remained a important figure, but mo not more than that. Nevertheless, it's Venerable Ananda who recited all the texts that we have today in the Sutta Pitaka. It was due to his photographic memory and his, his being close to the teacher, as the attendant of the teacher, and then hearing all what he's saying. Or got get it told on later on if he were not present. So that's why no craving for existence, no craving for suffering, no craving for samsara, then they, it's natural to go somewhere else when you have the opportunity to do it and the ability to do it. Question 204. Is it advantageous? This is five questions actually. Is it uh, advantageous to buy alcohol and then throw it away? 
Yes, if you ever already have bought booze, alcohol, then throw it away, flush it out in the toilet, uh, make a big issue out of it, post it on social media where you're flushing all your alcohol out. Very nice. But don't go and buy new alcohol, then flush it out. Because the alcohol industry is an endless industry. And then it's better to uh, preserve these funds for somebody else. Give them to monks or to the Red Cross or to Doctors Without Borders or similar organizations. But to give it to the Sangha, I will uh, recommend instead of uh, buying new booze and uh, pu pulling it out. But if you already have booze in the house, then uh, know that it's poison and throw it out. B. Can hungry ghost Peters eat physical food? Yes, they can. Uh, some few can, not all can, but some few can. Mentioned in the text has been that they have very restricted uh, diet, so they cannot uh, eat anything they, they can find on their way. They can eat only some special things. Uh, otherwise, if they take to taking up, either it will come fire in their mouth or they, it disappears when they approach the mouth with the food. But some can eat excrement, some can eat pus, some can eat vomit, some can eat corpses, some can eat abortions, some can eat menstruation blood, some can be, eat burning red coals, some can eat ashes, some can eat worms, leeches, insects, crabs, and beetles. And that's what's mentioned in the text. So you can see here, they have a restricted diet compared to us. But so also the animals, they have a restricted diet compared to us. And we have a restricted diet compared to what uh, the devas have. So the higher you come in level of existence, the more degrees of freedom you have to choose between various uh, qualities of food. The higher the better. So the peters, some peters, few peters, hungry ghosts, they can eat something but only very disgusting things. That is a comic echo of their future stealing valuables here on the food uh, from other uh, beings. There's two, uh, regarding a hungry ghost, there's two drops on what Buddha said that did. One is called ghost petas, and the other one is called hungry ghost rebirth. So you just, just go and search for hungry ghost on what Buddha said that net, then you can find all information there is on this very sad uh, and desperately long, can, they can live for billions of years, uh, existence level. It's for their sake, for one of these eight kind of peters that can receive food from their family members, that uh, you should serve food and dedicate the food you serve to monks, uh, to your deceased relatives, that because of misappropriation of values, fraud, uh, taxation fraud, insurance fraud, all other kinds of fraud, uh, mistaking of values, uh, theft, and so on, uh, they have become hungry ghosts. Because when you dedicate the mirror to them, they will gain food in their, wherever they are, in their existence dimensions, you can say. Question C. Does thinking of another's partner break the third precept? No, it does not. Not thinking about it. You have to have sex with them. How much sex? There has to be insertion of either the tongue or the penis in one of the uh, four holes. Uh, either the mouth, the vagina, uh, three holes maybe, mouth, vagina, or, or uh, anal canal. There has to be insertion to the extent of a sesame seed. When there has been the insertion to the extent of a sesame seed, then it is breaking the third precept. Question D. Can devas re-offer food dedicated to them to monks? If it's dedicated to them, uh, let's say I give you put some food outside and say, uh, may the devas eat that, then they cannot uh, give it to monks. Uh, then it's better to give oneself to the monks. Uh, it's always better to give oneself, not to give via proxy. You give to say to something, uh, give go and give to this person. Why not go and give to this person yourself or this institution yourself? It's like you're being invited to a birthday party. Then you don't need, you don't have the time or don't make the right priority to come. You don't basically care. But nevertheless, you give a gift to somebody else, say, I'll give you a gift for me when you come to this birthday party. It's better than nothing, but it's also not ideal case. Ideal case is to give with one's own hand directly from the donor to the receiver. 
Uh, that's the best. Yes. E is looking younger than one's age a sign of good karma. Yes, it is. So looking, being beautiful uh, and strong and youthful and anything that has to be connected with the body, looks or strength or health, uh, having much of that is a is a sign of good karma. Uh, having a beautiful mouth is a sign of having spoken beautiful words. Uh, having a beautiful facial expression is a comic result of not retorting when being criticized. Not biting back, not being a backbiter when being criticized. Taking the, critici the critique, the blame very calmly. And then one gets a very f a beautiful facial expression. Giving a lot of food, uh, especially to the monks. And you can also give food at what Buddha said, that net to this hermitage. Just search for online dana or kale super. Uh, I'll give the link below. And you can also click the small uh, hoover up, the small eye here, uh, and then there will become some links. Click some links, and there will come some links down below where you can click the food link, give food link. But nevertheless, uh, if one gives food, then it's converted in the next life because food uh, is converted into the bodies of the monks or the nuns you give to. And whoever you give to, if you give to a dog or someone who's in the hospital or uh, living in Africa or wherever, uh, then it's converted into bodily. Because it's converted into bodily strength and health, then one gains bodily strength and health, large body size also, uh, at the next in the next life. So looking younger than one's age is a sign of good karma. This was 35 minutes and 53 seconds. Uh, I just like to say then, uh, thanks for your keen attention, clever consideration and kind contribution. Uh, we have just started uh, building the meditation hall, which is very necessary because it's raining up here. It's not raining now, it's drizzling. Uh, and I will make some uh, video, there will come some video about it next week. But uh, donations and support for this meditation roof for meditators that comes up here is very welcome uh, still. And it's this, uh, of course, enables them to approach Nibbana. And when you give somebody else the opportunity to, to approach Nibbana, then you get the very same thing back from the comic mirror that reflects this good opportunity giving back to the donor. So this is worth remembering giving others opportunity to reach deathlessness, thereby increases one's probability and ability to gain this very same deathlessness, this very same Nibbana, this very same irreversible end of suffering, this very same lasting happiness, oneself. Worth remembering is that Namo Tasso Bhagavatto Arahatto Samma Sambuddhasa Friends, the Four Noble Truths, Tadzariya, Arya Satyani, which is the very core of Buddhism, are one. All this and such is suffering, Dukkha. Two, craving is the cause of suffering. Dukkha Samadaya. Three, absence of all craving is the end of all suffering. Dukkha Niruddha. Four, the noble eightfold way leads to the end of suffering. Dukkha Niruddha Gamni Patibhada. This noble, hateful way, which leads to Nibbana, is simply this. Right you, Samaditi. Right motivation, Samma Sankappa. Right speech, Samma Vajja. 
right action, Sama Kamanda, right livelihood, Sama Ajiva, right effort, Sama Vajama, right awareness, Sama Sati, and right concentration, Sama Samadhi. But what is right action, Sama Kamanda? What is this essential right action? Right action is threefold. One, avoiding all killing and any form of harming or violence towards any form of living being. Two, abstaining from all taking and thus stealing whatever is not given. Three, stopping all adultery and any sexual abuse of illegitimate partners. That is right action. On the characterization of right action, the Bliss Buddha said, Friends, it is caused by behavior in conflict with the Dhamma, caused by immoral behavior, that some beings here, right at the breakup of the body, right after death, reappear lost in states of pain, in unhappy destinations, in the downfall dimensions, even in the hills. And it is caused by good behavior, in harmony with the Dhamma, caused by good moral behavior, that some beings here, on the break off of the body, right after death, reappear in a happy destination, even in the divine world. And which are the three kinds of bodily, moral behavior that are in good harmony with the Dhamma? One, here one stops all killing of any living being, and one abstains from injuring any living being with weapon and stick laid aside. Gentle and kind, such good one dwells in harmless sympathy towards all beings. 2. Avoiding the taking of what is not given. One refrains from all stealing what is not openly given. One does not take by way of theft the wealth or property of others, neither in the village nor in the forest. 3. Abandoning abuse of sensual pleasures, one gives up misuse in sensual pleasures. One does not have sexual intercourse with partners who are protected by their mother or father or brother or sister or relatives or partners who is married or who is betrothed to another partner, who are protected by law, who are underage, a minor, who are in prison, or who are engaged to other side. That is how there are three kinds of advantageous bodily moral behavior. There is in good and fine, sweet harmony with the true Dhamma. Such fine behavior is right action. For further study on Buddhist right action, Samma Kamanda, go to whatbuddhasit.net and search for what is right action. Thank you for your attention, consideration, and help.